episode 272. Nice palindromic quality to that number. Uh, we're recording this live on February 2nd, 2023. I'm your host, Nick Rome. I'm joined today by Mr. Barry Kirby. Hello and good evening. And we also have Heidi Mirzad. Hi. Wow, I was very, very soft-spoken. I'm sure we'll get more strongly spoken towards the end of the show. But this week we have a a, a talk show all about culture, cognition, human-computer interaction. We'll also be taking some questions from the community about how to get over bad interviews, specifically with users, alternate ways to think about usability methodology, and an update for how to use ChatGPT in Human Factors Engineering, HCI, and UX. But first, we got some programming notes for you all. Um, Just, you know, really quick, I want you all to be aware of... We have some, um, you know, if you're interested in podcasting or working with human factors professionals, join the lab. I just want to say that at the top. Sometimes we bury it in a commercial down the down the line. But if you are interested in any of those things, want to help volunteer for the lab, we have a lot of stuff that we want to do behind the scenes. So please let us know if you're interested in any of that. Barry, what, and I was inspired by your little intro on the latest episode of 1202. You want to tell us about that? So yeah, so on 1202, um, we finally got the first interview down and it's out there it wouldn't have been out there quite as well if nick hadn't stepped in and sorted out the audio so my uh, very public thanks to you nick for for making the quality of that even better what it was but it so i interviewed stephen chorick and stephen chorick is one of these guys he's an author he's a lecturer editor he has many many hats um but he basically gave us an overview of his career and it gave us a really candid reflection over some of the stories or some of the interactions that he's had throughout his career um and he gave us a real insight into his thoughts on where we've been as a as as a as a practice and where he sees us going in the future so i was really really grateful um for his time and we've even decided to get some of the shorts out early um for this one as well so yeah uh, get yourself over to 1202podcast.com and have a listen or a watch of it on youtube it was a great it was a great listen. I'm I'm really happy with that episode. <laughs> all right. Well, hey, we we know why you're all here. You're here for the news, so let's get into it. That's right. This is the part of the show all about human factors news. Barry, what is the story this week? So the story this week is all about culture, cognition, and human-computer interaction. So recently, UX Collective put out an article on the importance of considering culture in the design of technology. The article details that culture, as a set of beliefs, values, and practices, plays a significant role in shaping human behavior and cognition. It impacts our cognitive processes, emotions, attention, and perception, as well as our beliefs and values. The language we speak and the cultural background we have can influence the way we interact with technology and the way we perceive it. The concept of cultural affordances, where the cultural background of a user influences their perception and use of technology, is one of the most important ways in which culture influences design in HCI. Additionally, nonverbal cues, such as gestures and body language, which can vary across cultures, can also affect the way that people interact with technology. It's important for human practice practitioners to take these cultural differences into account to design effective and user-friendly technology that can benefit a wider range of users. So Heidi, what are your thoughts on the, our ability to use culture in the way that we design our HCI? Oh, Barry, you're muted. Well, they were great thoughts. Rookie mistake. <laughs> oh, God. Okay. Anyway, I think it's a great topic. Super interesting. Um, that's it. Moving on. <laughs> but um, I actually had to think about that for a second because I thought it was something more different than than at first because I was like, well, it's a topic we already are aware of. And then... Um, and then read through it and then realized it is literally what uh, we face also in medical device uh, development and design, because when we design products, we have to design them for different geographies. So we have to take into account different perceptions, different cultures, how they think, how they perceive things, right? One of the things that always 
stuck with me was when I was working on a specific product that had uh, was for the OR and we had to put in a timeline of kind of the surgery and, and, and what steps you go through and whatnot. And there was a huge discussion amongst the team whether that should go vertical or horizontal because of how people perceive time, right? And it was then, to be honest, it was one of the first times when I was really confronted with the fact that yes, we do perceive differently. And I realized and learned that day that, for instance, Western cultures tend to think of time as a hor as a horizontal linear, and um, Asian cultures actually Eastern, more Asian, more towards the south, um, look at it from a uh, or a vertical, right? So it was very interesting for me. One of those first things. So I think that was was over a decade ago so the 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 cultural differences alone that shape a society every generation also moves on right so thinking of that it's it's so many things and it's a topic that i think we don't probably talk enough about because we just automatically adapt to every update to every progress we make right oh this is a new technology we got to adapt so we learn and move on right? Like the iPhone isn't new to us anymore, but if we think about it, it hasn't been around for an entire generation yet, right? So um, it's one of those things where I think it is so much more nuanced than we think it is. And it has so many more implications than we actually more commonly talk about. But on the other side, it also should be one of the main factors that you talk about when you design things. So it's uh, there's a lot of things that come together and there's fu there's funny little things we can think of examples right one of the things is that like if you're a gen x or an older and you you do little videos for insta or twitter or whatever tiktok as you can see i'm super social savvy um you can see them like you can see them moving their hand away and like pausing because they actually need the visual reference that they're on. They're not used to talking to a video. And then when you look at gen millennials and Gen Zers after, they instantly start talking. So there, there's so much of behavior and, and, and culture and norms and beliefs that go into it that I think it should be one of the main things you think about when you actually start going into the design concept phase of things. That's kind of. What do you think, Nick? Is it is it too general? I mean, I. No, I think just my my initial thoughts here are are when when I don't know. It just seems like one of those no dust stories to me. Yes, take culture into consideration when we design things, and that's very reductive <laughs> to think about it that way. And I'm, I'm really appreciative, appreciative of pieces like this that detail just everything that goes into our concept of what culture is. Because I mean, if you look at this article, like they, they talk about all these different aspects, you know, from diversity to the different cultural models, as well as sort of the, um, you know, design guidelines even used in some of these cultural dimensions. And it's it's a really good look at exactly what types of things we're looking at when it comes to designing for different cultures or designing for multiple cultures to use something uh, collectively. And I, I just think this is a great piece. So thank you everyone for picking the story. I'm really excited to talk about it tonight. Barry, what are your initial thoughts here? Yeah, I think it's, it is one of these things that it's, uh, it's almost the, well, yeah, of course we do that. We, we, we brilliant professionals aren't we? So we do, but the reality is we don't, or I don't think we, as you alluded to, we don't do it in the way that we think we, we, we think we do it, but do we really? And that, that's why I think we need to explore tonight. Globalization has really now slapped this in our faces. The the ability like for the internet for the communications um, really sort of shows, and you can see that through social media, the way that messaging happens through social media. You can see the differences in Western culture and Eastern culture. Um, if you really analyze the language and and what people do, um, it can give you a real give you gives you a real insight into in a way that we've just never had before. Um, for design specifically, I think when we're designing for different cultures, 
And I think this is particularly in non-safety critical areas, because I think safety critical areas tend to coalesce um around western ideals so an example i'll use is air traffic control air traffic control uses english as the basic language um and you have to use english all the way through um isn't necessarily always but that's the that's the common norm and so we we tend to drift towards western culture in that way but when you're doing non-safety critical things you you need to design for different cultures in order to get now to get success um but the thing i find really interesting is at the moment, we and I think we'll probably talk, talk about it in more detail. Culture we largely base on geography. Um, you know, we sort of talked about a bit bit about that already. But I find the application of culture, particularly subculture, really interesting because subculture, once you get there, you know, it's almost opens up that massive kind of worms because there's so many different types of diverse um, subcultures that are either intersecting or diverging and um, are completely not respective of uh, don't respect uh, ge geographic boundaries. Um, or any other sort of boundaries at all. Um, I find that absolutely fascinating. So yeah, I think I think that's great. Yeah. So I don't know where we want to go with the con uh, with the uh, discussion here. There's a lot of different ways in which we could tackle this. I think the the thing that I maybe want to take a look at here first is just in the perception of of these cultural differences in technology in general, right? I mean, how do different cultures de view, um, you know, what is their perception of technology? Because when you when you look at that broad global scale, there's going to be different per, um, different ideas of what technology is and isn't depending on each of these cultures. I don't have a whole lot of good examples, but I, you know, just at, the, at a high level. Then there's also sort of the mental models uh, of each of those cultures and, and how those... Um, how those mental models impact the way that we design those interfaces for those folks. And, and maybe Heidi, you can bring up some of those examples that you were bringing up in med tech uh, as, you know, one of those things that, um, you know, like how do mental models differ across cultures? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and then sort of the, the, the third part of this, this high level question is the nonverbal cues, right? So how do they perceive it? Uh, what mental models do they have and what nonverbal cues um, are impacting the use of that technology. So I don't know. I, I wanted to bring that up, opening up a can of worms here. Where do you guys want to go? Well, that's one, uh, two, three. Just, okay. I said just <laughs> throw it out there. It's the, uh, I mean, fundamentally, I mean, the biggest example that I had that was thrown kind of in my face through the pandemic was um, around pulse oximeters. So the idea that we wanted to look at uh, blood oxygen levels. And, and they were using um, infrared technologies to, to do that because they had to generate, we didn't have enough um, oximeters to go around. So people were, were creating new technologies to be able to get quick readouts to understand what people's blood uh, oxygen saturation rates were. So that was great. People were coming up with, with all sorts of ideas. But then, and they, they, they tested them, fantastic. And then they, they uh, were being used and they just got rolled out um, quite strongly. Um, you, almost ubiquitously um but then what they were finding is uh, pe uh people with darker skin tones uh were were dying um at a higher rate than people with with whiter skin and and it took a bit of time but then they realized that the that this um using the the technology they were doing was actually because they hadn't taken into account skin tone when they were designing it that the that the skin that the readings that were getting were um, artificially higher than what they actually were. So people who they thought had a um, blood, blood oxygen level of say ninety five percent, ninety eight percent, actually had in around the rates, um, and so weren't getting enough oxygen in the blood. And that was around. So basically, when they, they were designing this piece of of technology, tested it on effectively white people, and and weren't getting hadn't done any broader testing, rolled it out, and hadn't taken taken into account that. The, them, them physical differences um, in what was going on. So I thought that was just, that was something that really threw up um, this sort of how we did, how we deal with, deal with some of this almost straight away. Yeah. And I mean, there's, so that's a good example. Another good example would be sort of international, internationalizing a product. Um, mm -hmm. So if you think about anybody in big tech, right, you know, that they have to have their software to be used in multiple different languages and different languages uh, have different rules. And so like one example 
of even just something so simple is in in multiple countries other than the western countries they they use the comma as a decimal point in numerical representation um and so you know right there you have an example where uh we can't just put a a dot there because it's not yeah. going to be easily understood across everyone you got to adapt the system for each of those languages or create something that's universal heidi hmm that reminds me of my first attempts to write checks in this country with a decimal um, coming from growing up in Germany where we do use the decimal very differently and then realizing I was writing checks for quite quite the sums over here um, <laughs> but um, I, <laughs> nice jeez so how did you um, feel how, when you were doing that how how was that pointed out to you what you were doing was it was it at the bank or at the um you know no, at what did you point find out the hard way yeah was presumably I somebody pointed out to you what was going on. quite a few checks <laughs> well thankfully the lady at the counter was very very helpful and looked at mm. me and said ma'am i think um well back then i was still a miss uh miss um I don't think you meant to write it for for this amount and i'm like why and she's like well it's so and so and i'm like no it's not it's one point and she's like no it's not a point i'm like yeah it is and she's like no it's a comma i'm like yeah but it's a point and so the discussion went back and forth and back and forth and um those discussions are actually just like the article mentions the article goes a little into language right and the differences in how we view things especially with masculinity and femininity and uh objects right um and so which is similarly it touches a lot of things when you look at things and when you interact with things right it's it's not just the comma i mean it's three years it took me to convert from the date the month before the day in the year yeah see because that, that's just wrong I'll just point that out now. You just should of course do it. it's wrong. Barry, you and I, we know it's wrong. Okay. <laughs> Look, here's the thing. Here's the thing. I've actually started implementing changes after reading this article and because of this, right? So like in, in our Patreon and our news roundups that we do every week, short plug for that. But, um, you know, we used to put the date in the correct U.S. format, right? And then since since reading this article and waking up a little bit, uh, no, not really. But uh, like I've always been aware of this this standardized way of presenting the information. I just didn't, you know, it's not in my conscious because that's not who I'm designing for. And so I, I've yeah. reformatted the way that we do them to be date and then three letter month and then full year so that way it's Thanks, easily yeah. understood and that's a, that's an international standard of representing date so that way it doesn't get confused when you have you know just six numbers versus two numbers three letters and four numbers to at the end so i don't know it, it's another example and that's how i signed all my contracts so it was 10 years ago i mean i tried i tried and i tried that way and it just it was never going to go anywhere so i knew like this is pointless is a moot point and so i started doing the i do the number then i do dash and then i do the three letter month and then i do the year but i do the full year not just the two mm -hmm. endings the full year and i also if it's the fourth or the first or whatever i do zero one right mm -hmm. so i do the whole gambit right and i used to get teased so much for that like oh you europeans and i was like that's not European. That's actually international standard because you guys write it different. So we try to accommodate in a sense of having the international sense uh, way so we can all understand the dates, right? And so it's a very, um, th those are small things, but they impact your life. I mm -hmm. mean, think about this. And then, you know, me always, of course, bringing it back to the, to the medical environment, Think about that impact, writing a date wrong when it comes to medication, writing the volume of a drug wrong when it comes to the point in the decimal. All these little things that we culturally just do differently mm -hmm. and then implementing them in your day to day life. Now, throw technology and that that added complexity of 
well, technology always leaves doors open for, for human error, right? Um, then you really, you almost have a little, you almost have a little fire going, like a little, 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 tiny, tiny flame going, and then you throw one wrong thing on it, and it's boom, you know? And so I think about all the things when I was in school, um, and we talked about all the major catastrophes, right? We went human, I had a class that was in, in, in regards to safety, obviously, but um, human factors. And we read some really cool books. I had a really cool professor. Um, and he always chose the just the coolest books. And we would discuss the coolest cases. And I mean, but these are very, very commonly known if you work in the field of human factors everybody knows three mile island right everybody knows everybody knows the swiss cheese the reasons model right like how a couple of events lead to catastrophe like we all know these things but then to see them in 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 actual use use cases actual existing events right things that actually happen and you walk through them step by step there are so many that are influenced by cultural differences, perceptional differences, right? Just language, interpretation, authority, social societal norms, respect, right? Um, who is who is allowed to speak up? Who isn't allowed to speak up? What is interpreted on the screen if it's on this side versus whether it's on the left or on the right, right? Where do you start to look? I mean, thinking about I'm Iranian and um, think about how we read the other way, right? So how, what what do you put? Where is the most important piece of information in your screen if you have one culture looking from this side to this side and the other culture from that side to that side, right? Do you start in the middle always? Um, so there's a lot of things where yeah, of course, you know, social media and there's things like how we tend to look at things masculine or feminine when it comes to objects and we interpret little logos and icons differently and stuff like that. But then there's the huge impact and that is things that can actually affect people's lives, imminent danger events, right? So I think for it being such a huge part of design and such a huge part of our lives, it is such a little topic in most conversations and i think that's what you kind of meant barry right with the, with the fact that we don't for, for it being such a magnitude of of of, of pot stirring yeah. right possibilities we don't talk about it enough well it's in i, I find it really interesting because you you tend to design for the group you're designing for right so if i'm designing mostly for the military then i've got my military cohort it is western it is uk mostly um etc 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 so i've got no need to think about um true translation to other cultures or take other cultures into account but this was brought into sharp um realization for me probably i think it was about six years ago i did a a project looking at um social media and the how culture comes across through social media and how culture comes through technologies. Um, and I think this is worth, worth just bringing in some of um, Hofstadter's work. And what this, just as a really quick canter through it, the Hofstadter work basically looked at all the different countries around the world um, and grouped them into six main areas, um, which was, which I think is interesting and something we could probably talk about in, in depth, but probably on another time. But there was um, six main um, scores that they've come up with for each country. And basically they've categorized each country as to, on, on the, firstly on the masculine feminine scale. So is it a more of a masculine country or a more of a feminine country? You know, are the residents um, more affinity, uh, have more affinity that way? Um, What's their long-term outlook? Are they looking for big wins tomorrow or are they looking for big wins in 30, 60, 90 years' time? Um, how, individu how individualistic do they feel? Do they talk about themselves or do they talk about a group, you know, themselves as a... As a, as a do they be believe in the country first or themselves first? Um, their restraint, how, you know, how contained are they? Are they, going, are they going to be fit to outbursts or are they going to be sitting there simmering quietly um, um, in the background without letting that go? 
Um, what's their risk appetite, i.e. their uncertainty? Um, are they willing to take risks or do they just not like any uncertainty and they want to know what's going to go on, uh, basically risk averse? And what is the what they call the power distance, which is, you know, how close are they to the people running the country, you know, that you, from your, your, your general populace? Is there a huge convoluted hierarchy or are you sort of one, two, three steps removed? And they found that each country has its own unique makeup um, of these six measures. And and you can actually map them. Um, and then um, you can then use that to get a, a fairly decent understanding as a starting point of what type of culture you're dealing with if you then want to take a product and and, and launch it into that country. Um, and you can, I mean, the biggest in, uh, realization for me was if you're wanting to get a message across, in the Western world, we tend to be quite blunt and abrasive. If you want to get a message across, you put everything in the message. If you want to sell um, blue bananas on on the on, on the corner of the street, you'll say I'm selling blue bananas on the corner of the street. Whereas in uh, Eastern culture, you will go more around the houses. You you don't want to be so rude as to tell somebody exactly what it is that you want to tell them. You will go around. You will describe around the message of what it is that you're trying to do and use more um, more generalistic language to get to the point. Um, because otherwise, it would just be rude. And 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 therefore, if you if you are more, that's why I think they see you, uh, Westerners generally as as quite brash and abrasive, um, as a, and, we, and we sort of per perceive the um, the the Eastern cultures as much more um, honouring people and 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 very uh, around ceremonial and, and things like that. So I think that is you know it's not the be all and end all. There are, there are issues and. Um, discussions to be had around the um, Hofstetter's work. Um, but I think it's a really good, um, It's re the, the books are a really good read to give you a re an understanding of, for me, for taking a product and how to globalize it. Um, because if you start looking at this sort of thing and then say, try, start trying to apply some of that stuff, it's, it's, it's really useful. I got a question for you guys. And, and this is along the same lines of thinking about designing for cultural diversity can a lack of thinking about cultural diversity result in discrimination or exclusion? Why or why not? Uh, I'm of the yeah. opinion that it can, but I want to hear your opinions yes. on this. I mean, if if we uh, if we're gonna go there, I wasn't sure if we wanted to go there. But what about the um, my my old friend, right? Facial recognition. Uh, what about the fact that that software isn't it doesn't have the capability to actually make the the uh, fine nuances in people with darker skins right so a lot of misidentification with that software right a lot of um false like if that goes out false arrests false false accusations, false, whatever, the, the imprisonment, people being punished, people possibly being murdered for it, right? Where we go, like the, the, the sheer fact that it is, we are 2023 and we have a software where people literally did not think about that factor is, first of all, for me, mind boggling. Second of all, um, Well, let's just say it how it is. How can that happen? How can that literally still happen? We are so aware of that cultural, no, cult, cult, the, these cultural differences in that we all, not just cultural, but that we all have different, possibly skin colors, different sizes of eyes, different heights, different fa face structures, right? Depending on what, how is that still happening? And, and the fact that we, we, I say it as a, as a humankind, we did not take that into account when making such dangerous softwares, technology tools that we're going to use to target people with. Um, that is very troublesome to me. Very, very troublesome to me. And I think that kind of alludes to the same thing with a pulse oximeter, right? Like, how were mm -hmm. those designed not taking into account darker skin tones? And not okay. even darker skin tones, but different skin tones, right? So that that alone, that that is a conversation in itself. But the fact that these guidelines or these these norms and designing things like 
that we don't have something where you go to and say, okay, these are one, two, three, four, five steps, right? Whatever, and we go through the to the gamut, right? That isn't done because it is still it it, it is a topic that is not often commonly discussed because it's like. Nick, was it you that said kind of like, duh, you know, like, of course we think about these things. So it's kind of almost assumed. So I, 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 I care to venture the question here. Is it because we think that we already thought about it that we don't bring it up? Is that another perceptional issue that we have with this? That we think somebody, of course, must have thought of this because duh, right? But then it didn't happen. So could be. I, I do want to jump in, though, because there's I'm, I'm noticing a tendency. I'm not calling either of you out, but you've both done it tonight, that there's a tendency to conflate culture and skin tone. And that is something that um, I think I just want to point out the, the author of this article. I just did a couple searches for key terms. Not once do they mention race. Not much do they mention racial skin, color, none of these things are mentioned in the article. And I think that was absolutely intentional. I just want to be clear that when we're talking about culture, we are talking about sort of the beliefs that somebody holds, not necessarily the color of their skin. Yes, it can correlate. It can match up depending on geographic region. But I, I do want to mention that, you know, in the oximeter uh, example, you know, that's that's a skin color. That's a racial bias type of thing. And, and, in, in the facial recognition, there's absolutely algorithmic bias towards, uh, those of, uh, mm. darker skin tones. So I do want to bring that up. I just, I, 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 I want to call you both there. out on that. I got to interject there though, because isn't it cultural in some cultural cultures to not think of that group? I know. I so, was, yeah, I was, I was going to, so go I, I, I would care to say, okay, maybe in this article, correct. It's not in there. But isn't it cultural and a cultural thing in some cultures to not think about certain groups? So, yes, no, yeah, I, I, that's absolutely true. Conflated. Yes. Maybe it is conflated, but that is a part of it. So, no, and, very and I, I would back it up as well because I think there is. So, there was another example I, I was going to use. Um, which is slightly more nuanced, but well, it isn't more nuanced. It's, it's exactly the same thing, but a different way. Um, in the fact that, so we in, in, in Western culture, we are generally focused around the middle-aged white male. Um, and, and that is, even though we don't like it, thoroughly um, brought into the culture, which is why when that when the oximeter issue came up during the um, during COVID, um, I thought it was really interesting because we, we test on middle-aged white males. The other way that that's happened as well is with um, with Viagra. Um, Viagra is actually more beneficial for women, um, mm -hmm. and in, in on a whole range of things. But it is only sold as as a male performance enhancing drug um, because that's who they tested it on and they saw the um, saw the reactions to, and that is purely based in Western culture. But you are right in in some respects, and that's why I was quite keen to bring out the this idea of the of of Hofstede room and, and what we do. The the going back to the I guess the original question that that prompted. Um, what you said, I think for me, it, it boils down to target audience and understanding who it is you're designing for, because and this is why I make, I made the comment about globalization at the top, because if you are designing literally for within your um, cultural sphere, um, the example that, that, that Heidi gave around, you know, the way we read text, you, you either read um, left to right, right, right to left or top to bottom. Um, and and then you, you do that. So we would design um, a, a, an interface um, primarily based for our um, home market, and you do it left to right, right to left, top to bottom, and you you put your messaging in, in, in appropriately to 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 deal with that. It is then the transition. If you then decided to, to move your target market somewhere else, how you deal with that transition? Now you could just turn around and say, well. We've designed it. It's, it's been super successful here in here in the West. We'll go and launch it in a Middle Eastern country or a, an Eastern country with no change. And the product will more than likely fail uh, because you haven't done, all you'll have done is some sort of language translation. I don't know, maybe th maybe run, run it through some AI um, to, do some, to do some change. But you won't have done the same level of um, design work that we would do, we would have done for, 
I, how I was in the Western culture where we've done everything, um, you know, left uh, left to right centric, top to bottom centric, and put all your important messages where we would know what they've done. All you've done is change the wording. Um, you wouldn't have done that redesign route because we don't have, even when we sort of say we do, I don't, we don't have a great appreciation for how other cultures uh, deal with their interfaces. And it's, it, it's, oh, I just, sorry. I just want to jump in. Let's, let's just do one more round. Cause we're almost at time. I'd love to sit and have like a two, three hour conversation about this. Cause I think it's really important. <laughs> what we're here for is just opening up that can of worms for the community. So we'll, we'll just leave it there. Heidi, let's do one more round. So give me kind of your final thoughts. Uh, you can finish your thought and then do final thoughts and then Barry, and then, then we'll wrap it up here and get into the next section. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, to pick up where Barry left off with globalization and, and, and switching products from market to market, right? Um, he's absolutely on the money. That's why products fail, right? This is And this isn't just consumer products. This is medical product products right we i worked on a project for 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 over a year trying to to um adjust the design of uh, a very simple straightforward uh, pro medical product um just to fit the american culture because it was first introduced in the european market but guess what H healthcare and and cultural uh, uh, differences work uh, work there different and and it, the user was using it in a different setting and in a different context so it was never going to it was never going to win it was never going to win so those are yeah in, very impactful globalization touches it but i think as far as my final thoughts go i think maybe we also worked in silos for a very, very long time, right? Because we were restricted to different geolocations, different targets, different target groups, right? And as globaliz globalization moves on, I think we have to more and more take into consideration that products aren't necessarily going to have a version for the European market, a version for the Asian market, a version for the American market, right? So we more and more need to uh, kind of reel ourselves back and, and really look at all the nuances. And I think it is our responsibility as the people, as the experts in the field, I think it is our responsibility to bring that up um, in every design talk, in every concept phase, in every brainstorming, right? It is us that are ultimately guiding this process. However, I will say it's probably going to come down to the person who is most aware at the table because i think honestly uh when i think about your comment uh nick i'm gonna bring it up again but it is really one of those things where you go duh you know of course we're gonna think about it and somebody must have thought about it so i think it's gonna be our responsibility to kind of go like duh did somebody actually do the duh you know like did somebody really think about this and if not let's tackle this right and i'm gonna say right right now also i think we also need to come with to, to to terms with and make peace with that some products cannot be marketed to an entire world they need differences in each country location culture or whatnot there are certain products that are too dangerous to interact with without having the very specific cultural differences in it and 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 just as a last example, it, it already starts at yellow, green, red, right? Red means stop, yellow means wait, green means go. That is not the case for everybody. So I think that's where, you know, that's where I would leave it as a final thought. Yeah, we froze. Yeah, Barry. No, sorry. Barry? Yeah, um, I think my final thought is, sorry, yes, it's Barry. <laughs> uh, yeah no for, for me it's something that we we should be doing um i think we need to be aware of when we should and shouldn't be doing it um because there are different uh, different types of culture that we need to be need to be thinking about um but i think it's also something you can um you can potentially go over the top with as well if it's not i get this is why i keep on going back to understanding your the the scope of what it is that you're trying to do your target audience if you're if it's if you're focusing on a specific target audience and you know that that's not going to change, then actually you, you get a bit of a free pass at that point. Um, but there, it, just because we're not talking about geographic cultures doesn't mean we, we don't necessarily have to understand other cultures. 
Yeah. For me, my final, I guess, points would be to bring up some of the risks of oversimplifying cultures. Because there's there can be sort of this this train of thought to not necessarily design for each individual culture, but to design for universal use. And doing that, you might actually come out with design that's not truly inclusive and not culturally sensitive in a lot of ways, right? Um, mm -hmm. But I also want to point out that th this article, the role of culture in shaping human behavior isn't necessarily as straightforward as the article might suggest. There are plenty of other factors going on here. Upbringing, Heidi, you brought up personal experiences, individual differences that can impact our behavior. And so that's also something that we have to think about when we're designing uh, for some of these things. And then also the last piece that I'll mention here is that cultures change over time. I don't know if this article is necessarily keeping that in mind as, as we start to think about how to design for a culture because you know you you brought up that framework Barry and I think we should take sort of a a, a litmus test or that's not the right word a, a benchmark every couple of years to kind of see how a culture is changing over time um and and then start to design for that culture and make those changes appropriately it's it's a big monumental task but that's why Human Factors is here. So that's, <laughs> yeah. that's where I'll leave it. Thank you to our patrons and everyone for voting on the story this week. And thank you to our friends over at UX Collective for our new story. If you want to follow along, we do post links to the original articles and our weekly roundups in our blog. You can also join us on our Discord for more discussion on these stories and much more. We're going to take a quick break, and then we'll be back to see what's going on in the Human Factors community right after this. Human Factors Cast brings you the best in Human Factors news, interviews, conference coverage, and overall fun conversations into each and every episode we produce. But we can't do it without you. The Human Factors Cast Network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running the show come from our listeners. Our patrons are our priority, and we want to ensure we're giving back to you for supporting us. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like access to our weekly Q&As with the hosts, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Minute, a Patreon-only weekly podcast where the hosts break down unique, obscure, and interesting Human Factors topics in just one minute. Patreon rewards are always evolving, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you, and remember, it depends. Yes, huge thank you, as always, to our patrons. We especially want to thank our Human Factors cast all-access patron, Michelle Tripp. Patrons like you truly keep the lights on and the lab going behind the scenes. Uh, all, all your patronage really helps us go. Uh, and, and speaking of Patreon, we usually have the patri patrons choose the news, but everyone can now choose the news. We, we had polls up on all our sites, but now we're kind of centralizing everybody to Patreon. If you go to Patreon, whether you're a member or not, we post up the polls. You can select the news story for the week. Uh, of course, we weight our patrons with a little bit more um, weight there because they support us financially and they determine the direction of the show. But everyone can go and vote on which stories you want us to talk about. In fact, we got some great ones coming up next week. And I, of course, don't have them up in front of me because that would just make too much sense for me to do. Right. So. <laughs> Go go take a look. See what we have up on our uh, on our Patreon um, for our poll. Go vote on it and have a little bit of say in in what comes out on the show. All right. With that, let's get into this next part of the show we like to call. It came from. You would think with all this prep that I would actually put that in there. Anyway. All right. This this is the part of the show where we search all over the internet to bring you topics the community is talking about. If you find any of these answers useful, give us a like or a thumbs up or whatever it is, no matter where you're watching or listening, that really helps other people find this content. All right, we got three up tonight. This first one's from the UX Research subreddit. They say, how do you get over the humiliation of a bad research interview? They go, I, I'm a senior service designer and have conducted hundreds of interviews in the past. Generally speaking, my interviews go pretty well. I tend to get the results I want from them, but this time around, everything went wrong. 
I didn't properly set the context, objectives, didn't build rapport, just bombed it entirely. I felt so awful, like I should know better, and all these were rookie mistakes. Guess my question is, how do you get over it? I still can't sleep thinking about it. I want to reach out to a participant and apologize, but I know this could make it worse. I, I think I'm just spiraling here. Barry, what is your experience with this? Have you ever had one of this, one of these experiences? No, I've never had one. I think I've had plenty. <laughs> I think I think it's one of these things. That, you know, it's a day at the office, isn't it? And some days are just better than others. So the first thing I'll be sort of looking at saying, right, it, if the interview normally goes well, and they've stated they're normally uh, pretty good at what they do, something must have happened to make this go badly. It could have been something personal. It could have been something around the room. It could have been something about the person they're interviewing. They just didn't. He just she he or she just couldn't get that sort of chemistry um something just didn't gel right just as if you can work out what that what that was then that will help you acknowledge that and move on um but i think that's the the most important bit is that you just need to move on from it um bad days in the office happen and this is just one of the one of them things of a bad day the only thing i would say about your data though is if you've still included that in your data set or your your findings you need to record that you had that bad experience whilst developing that data otherwise it'll skew what you're doing you might know might you might feel it's still there's still lessons there to incorporate and and that's fine um but just make sure you you make that as your record but yeah it's a day in the office move on nick what do you think sorry heidi heidi what do you think mm, didn't matter <laughs> <laughs> um so I actually am kind of same same along the lines. I would like to throw out there. Let's do a little therapy session here. Um, something that I learned that uh, is the most helpful thing I ever learned is uh, nine out of ten times this person is not thinking about it anymore. It's you thinking about it. This person probably hasn't thought about it. For one more second since they walked out of that door, they probably thought, oh, weird, and then moved on, right? So your, consume, your thoughts consuming you is about your perception of failure, which clearly indicates that you feel um, that you made a mistake. So this is about you thinking you made a mistake. This is not about that person. That person is probably almost, I'm going to go ahead, 99.99% is not concerned about this anymore. So I would wipe that off my shoulder first so you can stop feeling guilty about that. Second, I would go through it step by step. Why did this happen? Do it as an expert. You are the researcher. Why did this happen? Find the root cause. And if you can sort it back to you just weren't prepared and things got out of hand that day, we're human. Move on. It's It, it happens, right? Um, lastly, um, I just recently had an experience that was a brand new one I had never thought I would ever, ever have uh, because you can't make that stuff up. Seriously, you can't make it up. Um, and it wasn't me being unprepared. It was worlds colliding. Things happen. Uh, this participant came in, shouldn't have been there. They were not in the mental state. They were there. They had some personal matters that happened that they spurted out during the session, but unfortunately too late. Um, we were 45 minutes into a 60 minute session and all of a sudden the person spurted out that um, things had happened, got up and said sorry and left. And we sat there baffled, uh, not knowing what happened. Um, the person started almost tearing up as if we had done something, but we had to trace it back, right? Yeah, you're in shock the first minute, first five minutes, maybe the first five days. And then you realize you go step by step through what happened. And when you realize that it, some things cannot be controlled, you can let go of it. And uh, one last thing, this is right now, the next study, this will be away. You, you will sleep this away with the next study. It, it'll be gone in about a month, depending on how, how many studies you do a month. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think the most important thing here is to kind of take a look at the lessons that you can learn from this, apply it. You know, it's, it's the same kind of reflective steps. Uh, you know, maybe talk uh, with a colleague, see if they have any other thoughts, opinions on it. But really, uh, the, the key thing here is to reframe it 
and don't think of it as a, an opportunity loss. Think of it as an opportunity gained. What can you change in your processes or procedures that will make sure that this doesn't happen next time or that you can relay that to somebody else? I think that's an important um, skill is to, you know, not necessarily look at it as a bad thing, but as an opportunity. And then, uh, you know, I, just in terms of the last point here, if you want to reach out to your participant, yes, that can make it worse, but only reach out to them if you truly think it'll add value to the situation and won't necessarily harm the 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 relationship that you have with them. I think those are the important things. All right, let's get into this next one here. This one is by uh, on the UX Research subreddit, Alt Contextual Inquiry. Is there alternative ways of doing contextual inquiry instead of doing it the traditional interview-like way? That's it. Barry, what's, <laughs> what's the answer to this question? Yes. Yeah, so... No. <laughs> um, I think it's the yeah. I mean, we we do it all the time in within human factors. We tailor we tailor our methods in order to suit the what it is we, what you're doing. Fundamentally, for me, it's about understanding you know what is it you're trying to get and does what you're doing pass the sniff test? As in, does it smell right to you that that you're actually still keeping true to the methodology? You might have just adapted it just to suit your means. Heidi, what do you think? Um. Well, I'm going to be super conservative on this one. I'm going to say no, unless you have a video set up and you can actually watch the video back. This person has a video diary uh, of doing it, whatever it is. Um, and you can formulate your questions to that because that's what contextual inquiry is all about, observing something and then modeling your questions to get to the point of what they're doing. Um, to go deeper. So uh, if you can do that, great. If if not, then do a different method, like pick pick something else, but don't try to make contextual inquiry something that it isn't. There's so many other things you could be doing. For me, this is an it depends. Uh, and and really, I, I am maybe alone in my thinking here, but I, I tend to think of methodology as parts and pieces that we use to address any given situation. And it's okay to adapt for a specific project on hand, given that we're all scientists here, we're, we're, this is some form of experimentation. It may or may not work. And it depends on a lot of factors like the type of regulations that you might need to go to. Heidi, for you in the medical world, you might need to have those rigid guidelines around, you know, methodology. But for somebody else, it might be, okay, well, we can throw in this component to it. We can, we can do a survey here and there, or, um, you know, get, you know, modify this thing to get the desired information that we need. And ultimately, that's the thing that's most important is what's going to get you the information that you need to be able to perform some of those or to be able to make some of those actionable recommendations. So I'm, I'm an okay to modify that's 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 where I stand on that. All right, we got one more here. This is <laughs> this is uh, on the user experience. I just subreddit. got live feedback and said no, it's not a method. Pick <laughs> a different method. I literally just got an IM for that. <laughs> All right, we got another one here. This one is from user experience subreddit. Can I? Should I use chat GPT during a whiteboarding exercise to help with ideation? The context here is that they're interviewing for a senior product designer role. What are your thoughts? Would you look down on this? Barry? Oh, I love it. Controversial opinion. But yeah, if, you, um, if you're if explaining about why you're doing it, what value it brings, and wh why you think it's a good idea, then I would, I I'd be very keen to see it because... I've I've started to use ChatGPT now in in a you know experimenting in different ways you know having it there and I've done it this week having using it there as a different head in the room as we were um, ideating over some stuff stuff literally on 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 our whiteboards using it to bounce some of the ideas off and get a, a different perspective we had three of us in the room and so that gave us the equivalent of almost like another three heads because all three of us were using it to sort of throw prompt into um, and then and share the outcomes that was quite cool. Um, and then I guess as uh, extending that example, I, um, I used it a couple of weeks ago as, as to give, give me a user in the room. Um, so we, we, to, we, I asked ChatGPT to be a pilot and uh, to give me a pilot's perspective of usability issues within a cockpit. 
And and there, I, I did this because I wanted to see whether it could do it, and, and I knew the answers. So it was a bit of a, a almost a control scenario. And you know what? He came out with some really good stuff. Came out with all the stuff that I, you know, I would expect it to come out with, and stuff I found. It also gave me some things that I hadn't necessarily thought about before as well. Um, which I, that was a point I was like, mm, that's interesting. Um, it also gave me some stuff that I was like, no, that's not that's not an issue for this particular instantiation. That's fine. But I could then go back and question it further on the one things that it like situational awareness and, and things like that. And that was really interesting. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily use the answers it gave me, but it allowed me to um, test a, um, an interview structure. It allowed me to test and almost like how I would interrogate, um, uh, a, you know, a participant in, in for this sort of stuff. So yeah, I, I'm quite a fan. So if you were to bring that, that to me for an interview, I will give you kudos and respect as long as you could justify why. Heidi, what do you think? Would you, would you let them get away with it? It depends. Um, um, well, <laughs> Nick and I, we were looking up something the other day um, with respect to human factors. And I asked, well, I asked Nick to ask ChatGPT to literally put together a human factors plan for a medical product validation study. And um, while it uh, was right on the money, um, it also showed me that it is only as smart as we make it, right? So um, the link between the interpretation of the step-by-step -step instructions, which were right on the money, but the interpretation and the skill to make that, in, call, realize that and call it into existence by actually executing the activity is still a human thing. So while at first I had to hold my breath and I clutched my pearls, and I wasn't sure if I was going to have a job in the next two years. When it then spit out most of it and was done, I realized, yeah, but you still need somebody to execute it, right? So at the end of the day, yeah, even if it is linked live to the internet and it can gather all the information from everywhere that ever existed, at the end of the day, you still need the person to make the human cognitive ability come to light by connecting the dots right um so i would feel very conflicted because i would feel like the person put no thought into it and um speaking of cultural differences i come from a culture where i would appreciate your two cents and if i gave you a task i didn't give chat gpt a task so Oh boy. So we got a yes. We got an emph emphatic maybe. And I'm sitting over here saying no. So that's a complete <laughs> mixed bag. <laughs> so I think, look, using chat GPT during a whiteboarding exercise during an interview, it could be bad news. Um, just depending on what comes back. If you're unfamiliar with the domain and don't know what types of things it's bringing you back, it's not connected to the internet. As of right now, it's, it's only got data from 2021. So it could be you know, complete BS that it's bringing back. And it also could make a bad impression on the interview, right? I think it's okay to say, you know, if I'm familiar with the domain, I'd actually bring up chat GPT and ask it a couple things right here. But in this exercise, I'm going to do my best to do it myself. That's a happy medium for me where I'd say, okay, yes, they're utilizing the tool and they're telling me that they would utilize that tool. Um, but you know, for the purposes of a whiteboard meeting, a whiteboard interview, I think I want to see how you think rather than how you use a tool to influence your decisions. Like, I want to know what I'm working with at a baseline before I get any additional tools uh, into the mix. Um, I don't know. The, pre the preview, the purpose of the exercise is to really assess your ability to come up with ideas on your own and showcase your problem solving skills. So, and you might argue that ChatGPT is a problem solving tool, but you know, again, like I'm, I'm looking at a baseline here. Uh, I do want to kind of follow up on just a couple things, though, since everyone's talking about chat GPT, things that worked for them in terms of using this in an operational environment. We could do this to populate personas. That's actually something that I thought about the other day and am trying and and having some relative success with. It's just kind of a baseline. It grabs the averages of everything. And so it's, it's a good baseline. Um, piloting surveys, you know, ask it to critique some of your work. What you know, here's my goal. What question the here's the questions that i'm asking to get to that goal do you have any uh feedback and then asking for generic feedback do you, critiquing you know like it'll sometimes bring up some things that you didn't think about and then just general copywriting 
All right, that's it for where it came from. Let's just get into this last part of the show. We like to call one more thing. There's no introduction here. So, um, Heidi, I understand that you are really fired up about something. Netflix. <sighs> have you heard the news yet? Oh, yes, I have. Yes, I, I have. Haven't, so, so enlighten uh, me. Tracking us with our geolocation to determine whether the main user is using it or somebody else is signing on, in order to avoid password sharing. And they apparently, so all these questions came up on the internet. So, for in case people have not heard about it yet, Netflix is. You know, as we, in case you're living under a rock, Netflix has been trying to stop password sharing. So they now rolled out in three other countries, they rolled out their new model where they are uh, basically allowing four people, uh, not four people, four devices on the same Wi Fi connection at your home designated home location to be signed on at the same time. However, when you then move outside of that location, you have to be verified by the home user, but you're only allowed to use it for seven days without, without having to re-verify, and you can only use it 30 days outside of your home. So this poses the question of that was Netflix was supposed to be, from the get-go, it was supposed to not tie you down to a specific location because it was supposed to be this thing that you can watch anytime, anywhere. You know, how, how did they call those little things like comedy snippets that you can watch on the go on your commute to work and whatnot. And now because their stock is tanking or whatever and they're losing subscribers, they're getting greedy like everybody, more greedy, greedy, greedy. And they wanna have more, 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 more money. And so now they want you to basically stop doing that and only use it in a certain location. And, you know, look, listen, corporate greed, we're never going to stop that. Capitalism, we're never going to stop that. It's always going to be around. My issue with it is, so where's my privacy? Where's my privacy? Now, Netflix is going to know where I am. Netflix is going to know where my home location is. Netflix is going to know where I go on my five-minute break. Netflix is going to track me around the world while, while I vacation in other places and determine whether I'm allowed to sign on to my own account that I pay for with my own money and my own subscription. Um, so, yeah, I'll wrap it up here and say, yeah, unsubscribe. I mean, I'm out. It'll, it'll, it'll make a money. If they're it'll doing that. Money. Barry, what's so, your one more thing? <laughs> Change the subject here. So this week I went to I went to a conference, um, in person conference oh. around looking at local government and how how does local how does local government perform, particularly in this one really around um, net zero and things like that. But fundamentally, it was looking around the operation of local government and how it's how it's evolved. And I went with my CIHF hat on, and really. I'm really interested around how human factors can get more integrated and involved in local government and, oh, well, government as a whole, and see if we can add better value. And so I really sat, sat with this entire day and just realized, and it was almost a crashing realization, even though I've been involved with local government myself, was there's loads of te there's loads of issues, there's loads of problems in local government from healthcare, social care, all these sort of things. But none of them are truly technical problems. We cite technical issues and all this sort of stuff. They're all about human relationships and all the risks that are there, all of the la all of the inability for our local government system to match up with our social care system, to, to not be able to match up with our NHS system, is because they're saying they're, they're three very different organisations. Well, okay, well, that's all down to leadership. And if you have an, uh, enough leadership to turn around and say, right, you will talk to this organisation and the three of you will get in a room and sort it out until you are all, all sorted out. Um, it was just really strong that actually there was a lot of lot of value there that the human factors can provide, um, not and it, not just at the design level, but actually looking at the um, at the organisational level and, and all the other factors that we do. So it was really good because actually it meant that the premise of the stuff I'm going to be trying to do over the next twelve months, actually I was I think I was right. Um, but it was just it was just a, a smashing realization that I, I should have realized before. Uh, 
So, but it was good. It made my very, very long day that I had to be up at four o'clock in the morning for um, worthwhile. Nick, what about you? Oh, man. If, if any of you uh, out there listening are a parent um, and have had to go through the stress of preschool is is just Okay, so let me let me just break this down for you. So my son is at the age now he's going to be in preschool here at the end of the year uh, or in the fall, I guess. And so there's like this huge lead time that we have to think about. Right. So we're what, eight months removed from fall and or seven months, I guess. So that's a huge lead time that we have to think about. It's highly competitive. And it's just like we found a, a preschool that we really like. We like the instructors. We like, you know, the classroom setting. We like everything about it. And. Um, you know, my, my wife went out this morning to go and get us, uh, basically make a deposit and say, we want this class, get, get, my, get our son in this class for five days a week. Um, and we got in, we got in, we got in there's, and, and cause we were, we were thinking about all the what ifs and okay, if we don't get into here, what, how do we approach? And so my wife and I kind of agreed, you know, we're not going to put any mental energy into the what ifs. Uh, or how to approach something and the alternative, I guess, until we know that it's not for sure. And now we know for sure that he's in and it's just, I'm, I'm super thankful. Um, it's a hugely stressful process because it's competitive and it, it just anyway, y'all have my sympathies. If your parents out there, that's it for today, everyone. If you like this episode and enjoy some of the discussion and maybe want to hear a real world example about how cultural considerations can impact tech, I'll encourage you to go listen to episode 263, where Heidi and I were on talking about talking to dead people, uh, and how some cultural reservations might be had about that type of thing. Comment wherever you're listening with what you think of the story this week. For more in-depth discussion, you can always join us on our Discord community. Visit our official website, sign up for our newsletter, stay up to date with all the latest Human Factors news. If you like what you hear, you want to support the show, there's three things that you can do. One of them you can do right now. Stop what you're doing, leave us a five-star review. Uh, you can tell your friends about us. That's the second thing you can do. You know, let them know, hey, these people on this Human Factors podcast talked about culture for 40 minutes and it was a pretty good discussion. Uh, or three, consider supporting us on Patreon if you have the money, financial means to do so. We would happily take your money to help put it back into the production of this show. No, I'm serious. I don't pocket any of it. I'm like thousands of dollars in debt because of this. Anyway, uh, help me get out of debt. And as always, all of our socials, our website are in the description of this episode. I want to thank Heidi Mirzad for being on the show today. Where can our listeners go and find you if they want to find out where they can share their HBO login information with you? <laughs> HBO. Yeah, because they don't they don't track the location. Well, HBO isn't that great, so well, they yourself. can track me at HFUX Research uh, on Twitter, on Instagram. You can also find us at HFUX um, Usability Labs or labs on Twitter and Insta and all kinds of other handles for all of our divisions. And if you have a direct question, find me on LinkedIn and DM me. Barry Kirby, where can our listeners go and find you if they want to talk about, I don't know, government conferences? <laughs> Buy me a coffee. I'll meet you anywhere. Um, if you want to come and uh, reach out to me on social media, find me at Basil underscore K on, on Twitter or um, any of the other social media channels. If you want to listen to some interviews with interesting people around how they do, deal with uh, human factors and, and, their, and their career paths, then you can find me at 1202 The Human Factors Podcast, which is at 1202podcast.com. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on our Discord and across social media at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time. It, it depends. depends.